My viral tale begins four years ago when I focused a telephoto lens on the six-story all-glass condo building across my street and began photographing the residents without their knowledge. The resultant photo exhibition, The Neighbors, opened on May 9, 2013 at the Julie Saul Gallery here in New York. Within a week, the New York Post had published two full-page articles labeling me creepy photog <laughs> and blaming me personally for the death of privacy. Dr. Phil invited me to be on his TV show to help me with my problem um, and offered to fly me free to California. Um, and every cable and, and news network van was parked in front of my building for quite a few days with those big radar things. Additionally, there were thousands of online postings, more damning me for the process taking photos through a window than for the actual images which grudgingly were often deemed beautiful by those same critics. <laughs> Amidst the, oh, as you can see, this is uh, looking through the window. Amidst this publicity onslaught and its direct result of it, one of the photograph subjects brought a privacy violation lawsuit against me, even though none of the people in the images are identifiable. The lawsuit was decided in my favor in 2013, but the plaintiffs appealed the decision, and we spent another year and a half in appellate court. I also won that case, but recently, motivated by these decisions, the members of the New York State Legislature have put forth a bill that would prohibit the photographing of anyone in their domicile from the outside without prior permission. I, by the way, am the uh, poster child that they're using as an example of what not to do. Um, even accidental, ca accidental captures would be misdemeanors under this bill. So this legislation is a whole other talk, but pay attention because it would, if it passes, it would be a deep erosion of our First Amendment rights. Next one. This is the photograph that spawned the uh, lawsuit. As you can see, it's an image of a child being held upside down by a woman. You can see her knee right down there in her blue skirt. They were standing close to the window, as all the subjects were, and the sun raking across the pair was so breathtaking that to me as an artist it would be impossible not to record. The dust on the glass fractured the light to such an extent that combined with the formalist framing of the window mullions, an otherworldly, almost painterly aspect began emerging. I took this photograph early on in the series and combined with the two previous image, images you just saw, so it really set the aesthetic standard for the project, which ultimately was, I think I had 42 images in the entire project. Only one, by the way, with a child. Um, prior to the neighbor's exhibition opening, this image was reproduced extensively online and in print until a court order prohibited me from showing it during the original trial period. This order persisted into the appeal, so tonight is one of the first times it's been public, seen publicly since I won both legal decisions. I even had to censor it out of the series monograph, The Neighbors, because the book went to print prior to the court's decision. And though not legally gagged, my attorneys and I agreed that I could not talk publicly about the case or my work during the trials because everything I said ended up online and ultimately out of context in court papers filed against me. So tonight is also the first time I'm talking in public about the neighbors, but again, I'm a little gun shy, so I'm following my script. <laughs> the combination of being vilified online and in the press while being dragged through the courts is a toxic mix that I would wish only on my worst enemy. It was like being attacked by a flock of rabid birds, all trying to rip bits of flesh from my bones as I frantically tried to protect my sanity, my finances, and most essentially my art. But as difficult and distracting as that was, what I found more disturbing was the speed with which everything happened, how facts were irrelevant, and how viral hate can manifest into threatened physical action so smoothly. People threatened to poke out my eyes, dog shit was placed day after day on my doorstep, and humorously, but sad in its misdirection, a group of neighborhood moms floated the idea of forming a posse to follow me whenever I left the house so they could protect their children from my camera and I. Again, this was based on one photograph of a child that you can't identify, but 
As a result of this onslaught, which was active on and off for a couple of years, and, and actually it's still going on to a certain extent, I began to see both online and print news feeds as mean, hungry babies with terrible palates. They don't really care what they consume, whether there is truth in the mix or who is hurt. Their only function is to get something in their gut on the screen and then move on to the next slaughterhouse. This may sound really melodramatic, but unless you've been in the sights of this weapon, it's really hard to imagine how wounding it is to your psyche and how potentially dangerous it is to your practice. It's very hard to work when you're being scrutinized like this and called unbelievable names and, again, threatened in various ways. Of course, there were ex exceptions to this feature shoot. Um, but to a vulnerable population, of which artists are perhaps the poster child, there is little solace when the haters initiate their craft. That said, and despite how powerless I felt at times, the experience of being caught in that whirlpool is survivable. Time helps, but also tuning it out. It sounds simplistic, but not reading negative posts and comments can be essential. Attempting to answer them or argue your case is not viable, as it just galvanizes the authors into pushing even further into negativity. It's whack-a-mole with a stacked deck. And I always remember, and I say this to everybody that's younger than me, which is probably everyone in this room, um, that if your work has merit, it will survive. What eventually happened to me is that the off-issue chatter eroded enough to um, allow the critical voice of the art community to be heard. This is the arena in which collectors and art institutions will view your work, not through likes, dislikes, thumbs up, and thumbs down. So since this work has been able to be seen clearly, it's, been, it's gone into the collections of many museums and, and many collectors and you know, kind of around the world, so that's the upside. And one final thing, uh, during the course of my legal woes, the plaintiffs offered settlement terms, all of which greatly compromised the showing of my work in some form. And as much as I would have loved to, have, to escape that never-ending legal process and the accompanying online attention, I realized I couldn't settle. I couldn't allow someone to censor my work just because they didn't like it or felt threatened by it. And also I kept thinking, what if this happened to an artist without the support or means to fight such a long battle? What would happen to them? What I was doing was I was funneling the money that I was making in the prints back to um, my attorneys because at $650 an hour, it kind of adds up. Um, but anyway, I, I thought, what would happen to these people? So I couldn't take that responsibility, so I just said no to the settlements and continually went back to court. Thank you. <laughs>